Um, again, my name is Bob Krugmeyer. I actually work for the city of Westminster. Um, I have three jobs. I am a water engineer for the city. Um, I do a lot of STEM classes for first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade students talking about water engineering and environmental engineering. Uh, I also help foster puppies in my, uh, at the house here. And then I'm the volunteer photographer for the Butterfly Pavilion down here in Westminster. So that's really what we'll focus on. Um, that picture is one of my dogs, little Bree. Um, and then of course I, as the rest of you now, I'm sort of worried about my Manfrotto mounts on my camera after listening in on some of the conversation. Hey, um, hey Bob, by yeah. the way, so we see the presenter view. Yeah, you probably see the next slide and the current slide. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. the time and stuff like that. Do you want to do you want to change it to the um or or hey, if you want to do it this way, that's fine. Yeah. I, oh, let's see. Let me see if we can do um, show active speaker video. You know, I we dinked around with this on a previous presentation, and I think we could not quite get it to work. So maybe we'll just leave this if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's um, fine. And then of course I always take my camera out to anything I can get photographs of. So got the camera with me all the time. Oh, now I've done it. There we go. So I do a lot, a lot of dog photography. Um, got a couple books out that we published to help raise money for one of the local shelters. And all of my foster dogs, of course, get some super duper photos. And plus you can't, you can't go wrong with a photo of a, of a dog. Um, so let's talk about a little bit the equipment that I use for my macro photography, I started with the Canon AE-1 way back in the day. Um, and then the 1DS Mark II kind of showed up and I converted over to digital photography and didn't really look back after that. Um, a couple of the photos that we'll look at, in fact, the one of the bug head right there um, are shot with that Mark II and it only had a 6.3 megapixel sensor then I moved up to the Canon 7D and I currently shoot with the 5 DSR. Um, for macro photography, I am constantly trying to get that highest resolution possible so I can get the best detail of the little critter that I'm photographing. Um, I started off with Canon's MPE 65 millimeter macro and that's that one to five X, very specialized lens. It goes from a 2.8 to an F8. Um, and if I had to give that, any kind of problem, it's that F8 gives you a slightly shallower depth of field as you can guess. Um, otherwise that lens is just absolutely incredible. And you can pick one of those up for about a grand through B&H, I think. Um, that's a neat little lens, really a tricky lens to use if you've pulled that all the way out to the 5X. Um, it ends up being about a foot long. Um, you can guess your field of view is pretty tiny. Um, I have since moved over to using the Canon's 100 millimeter macro. Um, and typically I'll use the EF25 extension tube on that. And then my favorite go-to flash is that lower right-hand corner. You can see that twin flash that you can mount right on the very end of your lens. And that provides that light that you so desperately need on a lot of the macro photography. Um, <clears throat> I don't use a tripod at all for a, most of my macro because I'm typically in the field chasing the bugs. And by the time I get a tripod set up and everything set the way I want it, the bug is gone because they're really not cooperative. So they can be quite uh, quite the little nasty ones. Um, here's a couple of cool shots shot with that Canon 1DS Mark II. Um, a lot of the students that I teach at the Butterfly Pavilion, they're only using kind of their entry level cameras, the EOS and some of the uh, Nikons that you can get over at Costco. And I like to show them that even with a six millimeter or a six megapixel camera, you can get some really nice shots of insects. And later on, we'll take a look at a couple of shots that I've done with, I have a iPhone 11 Pro. And even that you can get some really neat shots if you've got a cooperative bug with you. Um, this is another nice shot. Again, shot with a Canon 1DS Mark II and that twin flash on the front end. Um, this shot is nice because it allows me to, to talk to students about how many photos you can expect to take. And as photographers, you know, 
rarely do you ever take a single shot of anything you're out there and you take, you know, especially digital 50 or 60 shots to get a good one, especially if you're chasing wildlife around. Um, this guy was one shot, leaned in, grabbed the shot and it was really lucky, had the thing set just fine. And I really, that's one of my favorite shots. When I started really getting focused, not to make a pun, on macro photography and using that 100 millimeter, I started with the tiniest little aperture that I could get to get me that largest depth of field possible so as much of the insect could be in focus. As a result, you'll see a lot of these early shots. Looks like I'm photographing it at night because really the light drops off more than an inch or two away from the lens and it looks like everything else is just black. It's nice because it really highlights the subject that I'm trying to photograph, especially if I'm doing a series for the Butterfly Pavilion and we're trying to get specimen photos. Later on, after shooting with a couple of other photographers, I started playing around with opening that aperture up, getting more of that background and giving it a, more of a sense of the insect in its natural environment. And you'll see that change. And that's kind of what I lean to nowadays. Um, a lot of these shots, by the way, are shot in my front yard or in the gardens at the Butterfly Pavilion and along Big Dry Creek, which is just a uh, irrigation canal that's out here in my area. So the nice thing about insects, obviously, is you can photograph them anywhere, right? You can go to your basement and see spiders and they make perfectly fine subjects. Um, hopefully nobody is afraid of spiders because there are a few photos that uh, coming up here. Um, one of our neat little true bugs that we see uh, out on Big Dry Creek. And again, this is shot with a very, like an F-22, that twin mounted flash, uh, handheld. Um, a lot of the insects that I photograph, I try to get early in the morning. Um, just the circulatory system and the way insects have evolved, they're slower moving when it's cooler and they get a little speedier as, as it warms up. So if you can catch them at the beginning of the day or late in the evening, um, if they're not nocturnal insects, you can get some nice slow moving critters and get a better shot, hopefully. Here's a nice one of the garden. Um, I'm probably the only gardener in my neighborhood that gets excited when bugs show up and start eating my plants because I really don't care about my plants, but I do love to encourage as much varied insect population as possible. So front and backyard are, are both solid gardens. The food crops are in the back and the front are a mix of Colorado wildflowers and whatever I can to pull in as many native insects as I can pull in. Um, this is a tobacco hornworm close up. Uh, and you can see him munching away on a bit of tomato there. Again, this I think was shot later in the day. And what's nice is, I don't know if you can see my little arrow, but you can see his little eye sets right there. And then all the fabulous mouth parts of these little critters. One of my favorite, favorite insects to photograph are the wasps and bees. Those especially you really want to photograph early in the morning when they're a little more lethargic. Um, I have learned from experience not to try to photograph yellow jackets in the middle of the day. That can go ugly real quick, but uh, usually in the morning they're, they're pretty amiable. Um, European paper wasps, uh, honeybees, and a couple of others are really pretty friendly. They don't mind you if you're moving slow and you're not trying to damage the hive or do anything uh, that would seem aggressive. Other species like yellow jackets, um, some of the um, individual wasps can be a little more aggressive and you just have to kind of keep, keep an eye on them and react to whatever they decide they're gonna do. A favorite insect, and this again shot in the middle of the day, but with that tiny aperture, we lose everything else to the darkness um, that isn't getting hit by that flash. This is the milkweed beetle. Um, you'll see a couple of examples of these little guys. Um, if you have stands of milkweed, which is an important plant for the uh, monarch migrations across Colorado, you'll often find this secondary insect uh, that also likes to feed on the thick white sap of milkweed. Um, they're super bright. They're one of our longhorn species. Um, they're interesting because their eye segments are actually bifurcated by the antenna. So they have an upper and a lower eye. 
Um, and the antenna grows kind of right out of the eye, eye grouping, which is pretty cool. Uh, one of our more colorful bugs, you can guess in Colorado, a lot of our bugs have evolved to hide in the tans and grays. So we're lucky when we get some brightly colored insects. Um, in Evergreen, you guys might have some really cool beetles, the, some of the bluer and redder beetles out there in the forest areas, if you get out there and, and try to photograph some of those. Uh, one of our nice sweat bees. Uh, sweat bees are an important pollinator for Colorado and for around the United States, obviously. Uh, and you can see he's just covered in pollen there. This is a large sunflower in the front yard. Um, shot with the twin flash, but a single flash went off. So you can see that odd shadowing behind him, um, kind of darkened it up so I could highlight him a little better. It's probably about an F-16, again, shot with the 5 DSR and that 100 millimeter lens, uh, gets in a nice close shot and you can see the neat coloration of the eyes is really cool. Now we'll talk a little bit about once I uh, was able to photograph with a couple of, couple of other photographers, and they were using a much more open aperture in the F4s and the F2s. Um, I really, really liked how that put the insect, put the plants back in the environmental context in which I was shooting. The drawback, obviously, when you're shooting a much more open aperture is your depth of field gets very, very tiny. Um, you'll see some examples where only a small sliver of the insect is in focus. And if you're working on a plant and you've got a slight breeze, which here in Colorado seems to be every day anymore, and that insect is moving in and out of your depth of field, which is the width of about two millimeters, you can see very quickly where macro photography can become quite the challenging uh, endeavor. Do not drink a lot of coffee when you go out to uh, photograph insects. You'll get to be shaken bad enough that it'll move in and out of that depth of field focal point. Um, but you can see a good example here um, open aperture, very tight aperture with the flash, and you can see a very different viewpoint of the same plant. So I started moving more towards that open aperture, and uh, it's really a, a fun challenge and opened up a whole new world of, uh, of the macro photography. So here's another one of our milkweed beetles. Um, this is shot with a slight open on the aperture, probably an F16, F18. With that double flash, you can just see a hint of the plants behind them. Um, often, I like to catch these guys as they're coming up over the leaves, so I'm laying on the ground uh, to get these shots. That's a great way, by the way, to meet snakes, which has happened from time to time because they also like to curl around the shaded plants, so always be aware of where you're photographing, I guess. Here's the same shot but with the aperture wide open and you can see that nice soft green really provides a good counterpoint to that bright red beetle. So again, with the 100 millimeter, probably this one's got the 25 extension tube on there as well. And you can see the depth of field is such that that antenna is in focus, but the tip drops right out of focus. The second antenna, which is tilted away from the viewer, that's already dropped out of focus as well, but the eyes generally are in focus enough that I'm happy. So this is one of our native weevils. Weevils are a cool insect in that their antenna come off of the proboscis right in the middle of the nose. So you'll see these guys, they range in size from ooh, half a grain of salt to large ones that you'll see on cottonwood trees. Cottonwood weevils are a nice green color. Um, this guy, super tight depth of field with that open aperture at about an F4 to an F8, I think. Um, and when I photograph these guys, the tip of the lens and the flash units are probably an inch to a half an inch away from the insect. So it's a constant battle to keep in mind where that flash unit is. So I'm not tapping on the plant and moving the whole thing away from me and causing myself to go crazy because everything's moving, getting out of focus. So just like your camera strap dropping in, in shot, always be aware of where your, uh, where your flash is located. This is one of our shield bugs uh, here in the front garden of my house. Um, wide open, just an F2 with no flash and just lit by the sunlight. And you can see that depth of field is incredibly narrow. You know, maybe the edge of the eye and just a tiny strip of that body is in focus. Um, these guys are really fun to photograph. 
um, stink bugs or shield bugs as they're known. Um, just a wide variety, a lot of cool color. Um, I should mention there is a really wonderful book if you get interested in insects, and I'll show it to you when we get done. There's a field guide to North American insects, um, helps you identify things. And then there's a couple of really good groups on Facebook, um, Colorado and Wyoming arthropods. And those guys can identify an insect in under a minute. They are super duper smart. Um, another one where I kind of changed just slightly the angle that I was photographing. So I had a darker plant behind me to really highlight that guy. Did a much better job on the eyes this time. You can see that secondary eye. Um, a lot of insects, you'll see this next one, they often have secondary eyes that can see in a whole different color band, sometimes the UV, sometimes the infrared. Um, kind of fun, did not know that until I started really photographing insects and getting in close. Um, it's a great opportunity to learn about some of the smaller residents of our, uh, of our state. So that's a nice shot there. European paper wasp, and you can see just on the tippy top of his head, there's a triangular pattern of secondary eyes, um, totally out of focus in this shot. And you can see just his shoulder is in focus there. Um, these guys are another really wonderful pollinator. Um, you often find their nests probably where you don't want them, you know, under your railings and under your seat cushions where you're trying to sit enjoying a barbecue. Um, these guys are actually pretty mellow unless they're threatened or you start damaging their nest. The great photography, if you get them against a yellow flower with that coloration, um, they're a neat, neat insect to photograph. And again, this is a wide open aperture and about an inch away from this little guy early in the morning. So he's a little more lethargic. This next shot, I always like to play around with, with stacking all the goodies onto my lens. So this is shot with a hundred millimeter lens the 25 extension tube, and then a 50X spin-on front filter, plus the twin flash. Um, the fly was photographed very, very early in, in the morning, one summer day, I think, last year. Um, so he's not moving a whole lot. It was pretty chilly. But you can see, you can see the grain. Really, I'm really pushing this camera at this point. Um, but the image is capturing a lot of cool detail how how hairy and spiny these guys are. And you can even see on the short stubby antenna, they've got these little acoustical hairs, um, really nice close up, um, but a lot of silly stacking on top of the lenses to get this kind of effect. But it's a fun thing to play with. Um, I got the Raynor, I think is the brand name of the 50X spin on filter. And I got it off Amazon for 20 bucks, which is pretty cheap for just a, a fun addition to, to play around with. One of our little inchworms, uh, again, slightly open aperture. You can see really focusing in on those first four or five segments, getting the mouth parts in there. Um, these guys you can often find in your garden. A lot of gardeners don't like them because they're pretty destructive to, to leaves, but I get happy when I see them. Um, another fun subject uh, to get out there and photograph. One of our large, larger bees the, from the bumblebee family. These guys love sunflowers. Uh, this guy's got his little head stuck right in there, getting the pollen out. Um, again, shot with a twin flash with a much tighter aperture. So you can see that black effect where everything else has dropped out. Um, another similar shot with an open aperture. And you can see it gets a little more hazy, little high key look to it. Um, but I really wanted to get the, this wing pattern and how it looked against the flower. So a few of the spots are burnt out, but really the focus on is on this bee. So I don't really lose too much sleep over these burned out sections around the edges. And then if you really, really want a fun challenge, picture the, the 5D SR with the 100 millimeter lens plus the twin flash, hold that with one hand and then balance, in this case, a little cucumber beetle on the tip of a finger or your knuckle, and then just move that back and forth until he's in focus and capture the photo that way. And we do a series of these photos to give kids a sense of how big these insects are if you're looking at your hands. 
So we took uh, this cucumber beetle with a twin flash and about an F-16 to try to get a depth. Um, a couple of assassin bugs. This is of course a very adult photo, two assassin bugs deeply in love. Um, the female is on the bottom, the male typically smaller on the top um, and just perched on the tip of a finger and shot handheld. That takes a couple of photos, by the way, to get that one uh, in some semblance of focus, but uh, a fun way to do it. And again, the, the aperture is stepped down to about an F18, F20 to get that nice depth of field and really highlight that image. So no background uh, in the, to take away from the view. One of the harder insects to photograph when I typically use a much larger lens, I'll go out with my 100 or 400 Canon, is the damselflies, in this case, the damselfly here, or the dragonflies. They are very reactive to the presence of intruders and they'll often just flit away before you can get close enough to get a good photo. So with those longer lenses, you can kind of zoom in and, and get that nice shot. Obviously the depth of field is gonna be much larger because you're farther away, you're using a bigger lens, but it's a great way to, these guys are incredible. The coloration, especially in the dragonflies, if you get one of the white face hunters or the ones that are the reddish color along the body, they're just the gorgeous insects to photograph. Um, and often ones that folks never really see, you know, they, they see at them, what I call see at the, the animal, but they don't really see the details. So getting a good photo is a, is a really neat way to show people what these little guys look like. This is from a series, again, opened up wide on the aperture to, to let as much natural light in. Um, this is a bee mimicking fly. So you can see that depth of field drops right off trying to get the head in focus, but these guys are pretty fast movers, constantly trying to move around the flower to get as much pollen as possible. Um, so they're a great challenge if you're trying to, to get an image. This one's almost in focus enough to give you the hint of what the insect is, but not crisp enough to make you giggly. So that's still a nice shot. And then one of our larger uh, paper wasp species, you can see, and he's moving his head, but you can see those three little secondary eyes there. Um, and again, open aperture to give you a nice sense of where he's at on these flowers, as opposed to this guy, slightly different view um, to really highlight the body patterning and that one wing to show the veining on it. So a lot of what I'm out there doing is trying to get specific images for the butterfly pavilion that we can then use in educational resources and pamphlets and all that other good stuff. Um, plus it's a great opportunity to get outdoors and enjoy Colorado. One of the fun grasshoppers, again, I'm one of the few gardeners that yells hooray when he sees grasshoppers. Um, this is a nice one. You can see that catch light from the twin flash and then some of the highlighting on the body. This brings up an interesting note that if you're using flash photography on insects to help really catch that light, if you're using a smaller aperture, a lot of the insects like ladybugs, like several of the beetles, some of the grasshoppers, they have a really reflective uh, exoskeleton, that hard candy coating on the outside. Um, often we'll have to tone down our flash, reposition it. Um, in some cases, I've actually used a flashlight one of the high powered LEDs that move the light around. So I don't have that reflectivity bouncing right back into the camera and giving me these real hot spots like you see here on the eye. Um, just a fun tip, uh, something I learned trying to photograph ladybugs. Again, a nice cucumber beetle, uh, two different shots of the cucumber beetle. This guy looking right on the leaf, nice zoomed in with a soft background. Same little guy that I repositioned just to get those antenna uh, as a fun shot. So this kind of guess what this insect is kind of photograph. So if you're comfortable moving insects around, you can always uh, reposition your subject, which is rare in wildlife photography sometimes. Again, another slightly adult photo. Um, one of the things we also try to do is capture insect behavior. A uh, couple of these uh, assassin bugs, male on top, female on the bottom. And then 
Same verse, uh, different tune for our milkweed beetles. Again, wide open apertures to get that nice soft tone for the image. Um, male on top. And then crane flies, which look like very giant mosquitoes. They're great uh, insects for controlling mosquitoes. Um, this pair obviously making some more uh, of their brood to help us with our mosquito population here at my house, at least. A um, couple of nice shots of one of the individual wasps. I think this is a wood wasp. Just still learning some of my insect names from the front view. And then again, from the side view, beautiful blue banding. Um, and the open aperture really catches that nice pink flowers that he's in there working or she's in there working. Um, solid black, a tighter aperture would have lost all of that. And I think taken away a little bit from that image. Similar here, um, funny story on this one, one of the few insects that I'm able to photograph in the field, especially considering where I volunteer, butterflies are my biggest challenge. Um, they don't like people leaning over them. They've obviously evolved not to be eaten by birds and other voracious butterfly eaters. So when you're leaning over them with a camera, their immediate response is to flutter away and not pose particularly nicely for you. So I'm always happy when I get a good, semi-good photo of a one of our butterflies uh, out in the field. And then this one's a toughie, but you can see an assassin bug has captured a housefly. And you can see the little butt of the housefly here. And then the assassin bug is grabbing that. That's always fun if you're out photographing a lot of insects. You can see some of this actual real world drama uh, that goes on just right under our noses every single day in our gardens. Um, then a spider alert if you're anybody doesn't like spiders coming up. Um, this is the uh, cast off exoskeleton of one of our grasshoppers. You can see this guy just emerging from the exoskeleton. He's pulled out. He's got his brand new skin here. So he's not going anywhere. That made a great shot on one of my front yard sunflowers. Um, nice light green color. So if you really start looking for insects and you get into the habit of of just glancing around with your camera, you'll see some of this neat stuff that happens all the time. And it's really cool to get a picture of. If you're lucky, you will also, I'm sure you've seen around your homes, these cat face spiders. They're a very common orb weaving spider. They show up generally in the later uh, summer, fall above our doorways, in our railings, um, where insect traffic might be moving back and forth, fairly large, Little spiders at full maturity, about an inch, um, very spiny, uh, beautiful orb webs again. Those are great to take a picture of in the morning with the dew on them if you get the right lighting. Um, if you're comfortable handling these little guys, this is the female, you can relocate them so you can get a better front facing shot. And you can see typical four eyes up front because she is um, more of an ambush hunter as opposed to a wolf spider, wall the wolf spider highs, huge eyes. If you've ever seen a picture, I don't know if I have a wolf spider on this particular series, but wolf spiders are active hunter spiders and their eye arrangements are completely different from an ambush spider eye pattern. The other four eyes are located on the sides of her head. So much smaller secondary eyes. Another one of our fun, what's this bug photo? I actually relocated this milkweed beetle to just a stick, held the stick in one hand, and then a tiny aperture. So I got just blackness around him with the twin flash and was able to get a photo of him hiding essentially behind the stick. Not what you'd really find in nature, but kids don't know that. And it's fun to show them these kind of interesting visually um, guesswork their photos for them, try to figure out what insect that is. And then occasionally we'll find some cool little um, insect. I have no idea what this is. It's probably one of the member of the fruit flies. What caught my eye was this patterning on the wing. So I really tried to get as much of that as I could in focus. These are flower stems. So you can get a sense of how tiny this little guy is. Um, and just made for a neat shot. And I still have to get this guy identified with my friends on uh, Colorado arthropods, but a neat shot of, of one of our flies. My absolute favorite spider in the entire world are jumping spiders. This is one example of 
multiple species that we have here in Colorado, ranging from the teeny tiny tiniest to large red ones that you'll see often in the field. Um, typically, these guys have beautiful fang sheaths. You can see these pedipalps right here. This one's a male. Between the pedipalps with the front facing manipulative organs, they have beautiful blues and greens. So just they're gorgeous to photograph if you can find one. If you find a jumping spider and you can put him on a table, if you tap, they will actually turn towards the tap and you can literally get those guys to pose for photos. So they're one of the few spiders that will respond to tapping. You can tell these guys are an active hunting spider because look at those big eyes in the front. They definitely are a visual based uh, hunting spider, kind of cool. Every once in a while, I get to take photos at the butterfly pavilion when I'm not running around outside. This is from our ocean uh, displays, kind of shooting through the glass to get some interesting color. And this is our lionfish. Um, we, I used to have a bunch of photos of our octopus who sadly just passed away. Um, they're the neatest creatures, but they live such short lifespans. Um, I don't think the octopus is in this slide series. But if you get down to the butterfly pavilion, definitely give me a shout. We'll give you the grand tour and uh, we can photograph what other sea creatures we might have in our little uh, oceanfront aquarium area. The other neat thing that happens when folks learn that you are interested in insect photography and macro photography is they will bring you stuff. One of my neighbors brought me this. This is a tomato, a small cherry tomato covered in stink bug eggs. They look like little pepper pots here. Um, we were going to photograph the life cycle of these guys. And I came back the next day thinking that would be long enough for them to be uh, hatching so we could catch some in mid hatch. Uh, the birds had cleaned these eggs off completely and we lost that shot. So I guess the lesson there is bring your eggs home with you and don't leave them outside, I suppose. Um, that's shot with about an F-18 with the twin flash. Um, Probably the 100 plus the EF extension tube, those eggs are about the size of grain of salt. So they're pretty tiny. And I wanted to get the detail of that patterning on the egg. And then of course, flower photography is, I'm sure you guys have, have seen presentations. That's a whole nother world of macro photography that I have just barely dabbled in. Um, it's really fun. Mostly I'm focusing on the bugs that are on the flowers, but definitely flower photography is another whole aspect um, that can take up entire books. Um, the next series of photos are macro photos that I've taken with just the iPhone Pro. So pinch zoom, um, which ends up with a little bit of pixelation, but still you get a nice quality photo and you're not lugging around a big camera. You've got the phone with you all the time and you've got a cooperative monarch butterfly here who's busy getting nectar. Um, you can get a really good shot with just the iPhone. So even if folks don't have the camera on them, you can still do macro photography, which is awesome. Here you can see when I shoot just barely pinch zoomed and then pinch zoomed to 10X, you can really see that pixelation. But as we say in photography, if that's the way you're gonna get your shot, that's the way you're gonna get your shot. And if, only, if you only have your phone, then by golly, take the photo. And here is nice because you can really see that coiled proboscis this is one of our nectar feeders and they'll go into the flower and they'll uncoil that long tongue and they'll get the, the nectar and the pollen that they then will consume for their food. Uh, another shot with the iPhone and even the detail on this, you can see the hair on this wing and the slight chromatic aberration here in, in the scales that are catching just a little bit of that green light. So, uh, I'm currently saving up my money for the new iPhone 13, which I understand will be photographing in RAW. Maybe the 12 does too. That I'm not sure, but pretty excited about the iPhone 13 and, and pushing that camera uh, boundaries a little even a little further. So that in a quick nutshell, let me see if this thing's going to die on us here. And if that, you can see this, this was photographed last year. Oh, there we go. Um, I was out working in my front garden um, and I have a whole colony of European paper wasps 
that have gotten fairly used to me going in and bothering them and interrupting their activities. This guy was perched right between two stems of one of my smaller sunflowers. And I was able to get, had the camera gear all put together, ready to go and got this really nice shot of him peering at me through the V of the, of the stems and made for a really neat shot. Um, here are my two Instagrams. Uh, Fail Galds is typically a lot of my insect photography. Cassidy Bree is where I place most of my dog, cat, and other animal photography because I learned that people who like kittens and puppies sometimes don't like spiders. So there we are. Let me see if I can bounce out of that and stop sharing. And there you go. That is a fast look at what I do every day in the summer. <laughs>